When you look at some of the data, there was a recent meta-analysis that found, this is looking at breath testing, but IBS patients had a 36% positivity rate for SIBO. Healthy controls had a 28% positivity rate for SIBO. Only an eight percentage difference between the groups. And this is from a meta-analysis. This isn't me cherry picking one best case scenario study. And I think that's important for our audience because one of the things I'm noticing is the acknowledgement of SIBO is outsized to the prevalence of SIBO or, or at least from my vantage point. So I'm not saying it's not a part of the conversation, but I think it's really becoming oversized. That's my perspective. Uh, thoughts on SIBO? Well, absolutely. I mean, a very thorny issue to deal with. Um, the, the the main issue being, you know, the the gold standard to diagnose SIBO is to do something that's quite invasive and uh, an enteroscopy and aspirate, you know, jejunal or small bowel fluid uh, for culture. Um, whereas, you know, most studies that look at the prevalence of SIBO in people with IBS are doing something called breath testing, which is actually giving a person a, a carbohydrate um, and um, measuring when it may or may not be being digested by the gut's bacteria and the you know the, the, there's evidence from from some of the more elegantly designed breath test studies where particularly a, a study from a Canadian group where they did a breath test at the same time as giving the patients a radio labeled meal that actually um, the breath test is a marker of transit for some people. Uh, so people with rapid transit who look like they've got bacterial overgrowth, what happened was actually the sugar had already reached the colon and was being fermented by the colonic bacteria because it was there at the same time as the meal. Uh, so the rise in the breath hydrogen was actually corresponding to the, the 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 sugar reaching the colon and being fermented there. And, and therefore, you know, this is not a marker of SIBO in some patients and as you say prevalence of you know 35 percent i mean for most people with SIBO there's really you would imagine there has to be a structural explanation for that so you know they've had a partial gastrectomy or they've had previous intestinal surgery or they've got a diverticulosis of the of the small bowel or they've got a multi-system disorder like scleroderma but you know most people with ibs won't have those sorts of risk factors so it's you know it's unlikely that the prevalence of SIBO is 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 thirty five percent or whatever in in people who meet criteria for IBS. Right, and then you have the Mark Pimentel hypothesis of post infectious IBS stimulating an autoimmune process in the gut that thwarts proper motility. But even with that being said, we'd likely see, in my opinion here, a higher prevalence of SIBO in IBS populations discriminating from healthy controls if this post-infectious IBS hypothesis was as common as it's portrayed to be. Yes, and of course, I mean, only around about one in 10 people with IBS will be able to identify a precipitating acute enteric infection. So that doesn't account for the other 90% of people. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know if you, you're probably aware of the very nice paper in Nature from a couple of years ago that showed that um, if you infect a mouse uh, with a bacterium at the same time as feeding it a particular dietary antigen and then you um, reintroduce the dietary antigen after the infection is resolved, what actually happens is that the infection breaks or bro breaks oral tolerance to the dietary antigen and then the dietary antigen can start to interact with the immune system and create an immune response uh, the hallmarks of which were uh, diarrhea and abdominal pain, which are, you know, symptoms compatible with IBS. So that, that that's that's another way, you know, I'm not sure that a, a gastroenteritis is always sending someone down the SIBO route. It may be that it's breaking tolerance to a, to a normal dietary antigen. Yeah, and, and um, let's put on the board the immune system component, because I definitely want to come back to that in more detail in a moment. One thing I just wanted to make as a side remark is I have this, this growing concern that people are conflating, I've responded to a SIBO treatment with that means that I have SIBO. And if you look at the research literature, there's actually more people who respond to SIBO treatments, whatever they may be, than actually have SIBO. And if we don't acknowledge that, then this, this canard can kind of propagate where 
people keep trying SIBO treatments, whether it be rifaximin, an elemental diet, maybe a probiotic, maybe a low FODMAP diet, and they say, well, I responded, therefore I have SIBO. Yeah, sure. And I mean, it's, it's further compounded by the fact that the pivotal trials of, of rifaximin in IBS were not done in people who had a positive breath test, of course. They were done in, in all comers. And actually, if you look at the, ther- the, therapeutic, the therapeutic gain of <coughs> rifaximin over placebo in those trials, it is a remarkably similar therapeutic gain to, the, um, to that that you see with eradication therapy for helicobacter pylori, which consists of an anti- two antibiotics and a, and, a, and a proton pump inhibitor in people with functional dyspepsia. So, you know, you can't rule out that antibiotics have a beneficial effect in people with these disorders of gut-brain interaction like IBS and functional dyspepsia. But whether that's arising from treatment of SIBO, I think is is debatable. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, I think that's a great point.